Welcome back. You're watching the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with the global CEO of Rockwell Automation. So capital allocation and capital prioritization at this point in time, you know, what, what are you factoring in given the growth strategies uh, that you're working on? Well, first priority is for our internal usage of uh, capital and we're really more of an intellectual property company so we don't have an enormous amount of capital demands mm. for our ongoing operations but um, we continue to uh, make investments. The plant in Chennai is a good example of that. Uh, and we have other facilities, existing facilities, adding capacity to, making more efficient. Really, I think the next year or two is going to be marked by integrating all of the acquisitions that we've made, mm. all of the new capabilities that we've developed to help simplify automation for our customers. So we've assembled a very broad portfolio of capabilities for production control and information management. Now the task is to integrate the parts. Uh, you know, you talked about efficiency, so let me address that for what's happening within Rockwell at this point in time. Uh, you have outlined a cost-saving plan that you mm -hmm. are working towards. There's also been a restructuring uh, as far as headcounts are concerned. You are uh, cutting jobs at, mm -hmm. at this point in time. Uh, you know, do you believe that that should be enough for now? You know, based on our view of current business condi conditions, we're largely done with that part of the cost-cutting program. We'll, of course, see benefits from the actions already taken continue into next year. The focus now is on looking at other parts of our cost pool, uh, what we pay for material, purchase services, manufacturing efficiency. So we're spending a lot of time on that, driving the inefficiency out of our processes that accumulated inevitably as a result of mm -hmm. the volatility of the last few years to be able to create a more efficient pure play organization. You also talked about uh, uh, M&A and the acquisitions that you've done and you're uh, digesting them, so to speak, yes. at this point in time. So, uh, you know, uh, is that what you intend to consolidate on or are there areas of opportunity that you continue to look at today? We continue to have a pipeline that we review, but the focus now really is on integrating the pieces that we've already built and bought into a complete result. Because what customers are looking for is easy to integrate solutions mm. and with the hardware and the software and the high value services we have, we see knitting together those pieces as our top priority. So what is looking exciting now, uh, you know, through 2024 and of course uh, uh, in 2025, in in terms of opportunities, in terms of innovation, the new areas that you intend to go after? Well, we've, we've assembled a, an unmatched portfolio of cloud solutions for information management within manufacturing. And whether it's in the U.S. or it's in India or other places in the world, the key to competitive manufacturing is to be able to make the best use of the data that comes off of those mm. basic processes. And our portfolio of software solutions, consulting resources is second to none. So I see a lot of opportunity across the verticals that we talked about earlier. In addition to that, one of our most recent acquisitions was with mobile robots. Mm -hmm. And so in the production process, you have a lot of fixed automation on the lines, doing sortation and things like that. Right. But being able to bring material to those lines and taking the finished product away mm. to the loading dock mm. or the warehouse mm. is an area of huge opportunity for efficiency. And by adding mobile robots to our portfolio, we can integrate those pieces together into the whole as well. You know, you talked about mobile robots, and that brings me to the question that you're probably asked a lot as well, which is what is all of this going to do as far as the future of jobs is concerned. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge here in a country like ours, while mm -hmm. the government is hoping to build up the manufacturing sector. But is it really going to be able to create the kind of jobs uh, that one was used to and one expects in an era of smart manufacturing, automation, mobile robots? Mm -hmm. I mean, what does the future of jobs look like? Well, it does evolve. So the nature of work in manufacturing facilities does change. I like to think of the technology that we're providing as adding superpowers to a workforce which in many parts of the world is scarce. And so it's being able to provide the maximum productivity from scarce workers in these factories 
they're going to have to be more comfortable interacting with the technology. And so workforce development is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. Augmented reality, um, uh, you know, all of the technology to help them make the most of the data that's available is a part of it. Um, but being able to interact with the technology, regardless of the area of manufacturing you're in, is going to be absolutely essential. It's a trained and enabled and energized workforce mm. working in concert with the technology, and that's really the winning hand. Well, you know, that, as you said, that that would be uh, necessary in, in economies and countries where people are a scarce commodity. That's quite the opposite here in India. So how right. do you see it playing out in India? So in India, yes, the dynamic is different. You have such a young population. And, and a uh, large young population. A large, young, increasingly very well-educated, entrepreneurial population. What I see is it enabling India to take its place in global value chains by being able to couple the technology with that workforce to be so competitive to be able to earn the position in value chains for manufacturing around the world. This week we had some very mm. exciting conversations with Indian manufacturers looking at ways that we can take their understanding of how to get to scale fast with our domain expertise and bringing that together. Mm -hmm. So in India, when you talk about the opportunities, especially opportunities to help Indian companies scale, you know, any sectors in specific that you're focused on? I think you can go across multiple areas of manufacturing. In discrete manufacturing, it's areas like automotive, in semiconductor, warehouse automation, in uh, manufacturing that has elements of process control as well, food and beverage, mm. uh, being able to provide more variety, more packaging formats in choice and food. Pharmaceuticals is an area of particular strength for us in the Indian economy. And then in energy, uh, in process applications, energy, uh, energy transport, mining, all of these areas represent opportunities. Well, speaking of opportunities, uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in general, but Gen AI in specific, yes. what's the Rockwell bet on that, if one at all? It's, it's going to help simplify this whole business of automation, and I think that at the end of the day Day is really going to sort out the winners and the losers in this business. Uh, in the next couple of months, we're going to be introducing a co-pilot for our newest programming tool, a cloud-native programming application, when with a Gen AI co-pilot, it's going to allow people who don't necessarily have the years of experience mm. with the very custom languages that have been used to program this equipment to be able to create programs that are going to make uh, the business of configuring automation systems much simpler and much quicker. So what does that do then uh, to, uh, you know, programming jobs, to coders? Because that's the, other, that's the other sort of dilemma that people are debating and discussing, that in a gen AI world, uh, what, what happens to the engineers? It's going to take hours out of individual tasks, but it's going to allow those programmers to focus more on innovation and less on syntax. It's going to allow them to hone their skills in terms of making the right questions to be able to draw from libraries of pre-engineered code to bring that together. So I see it uh, allowing their jobs to be much more efficient and for them to be more productive. Are you are you on a co-pilot yourself? I mean, how? I do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, every day. Um, you know, I think in some in some way I'm using a co-pilot every day, and a lot of times I'll test you know hypotheses about best opportunities for growth in certain areas and to see what the co-pilot returns in terms of ideas about new business opportunities. So it's definitely at a higher level, but it's impacted my life as well. What did it say the last time you checked? When, when <laughs> we looked at the best opportunities for generative AI, I'm not going to reveal too much about other things we're working on. Because I imagine you're working on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And it's a good, and it's a good fit. I would say um, it's also still an area we're working with partners is very important. And so we're working with some of the best in the business to make sure that we're focusing on the things that we can do uniquely well and working with partners who are best in class in their own right to create the fastest result. Let me end then by asking you, Blake, you know, we talked about uh, 
volatility that the world is currently in the midst of, and that's nothing mm -hmm. new. We've gotten used to that. The challenge today is that you've got geopolitical tensions, mm -hmm. and that is an outcome that you have no control of. So right. uh, what would you classify as your key risks uh, you know, that you're most concerned about today? No, I think it's I think it's creating resilient supply chains, and that's uh, the same answer for us in our own operations as well as for our customers. And so, looking at uh, having manufacturing processes where we have dependable and, if possible, redundant sources of material, where we're close to the customer. Um, those are things that are important to us, and they're important for our uh, customers as well. Cybersecurity resilience uh, is certainly critically important given the rise of attacks against manufacturing and critical infrastructure. And so that resilience and finding ways to make that real for our customers and to give them the flexibility to be able to make the most of their existing investments, I see that's the number one challenge. Well, Blake, it's always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here on the Global Dialogue. We hope you have a productive India visit and we look forward to seeing you uh, soon again back here and, of course, in Davos. But many thanks for your time today. Looking forward to the next time. Thank you. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the team, for now, goodbye. Many thanks for watching. Stay tuned. The news will continue on CNBC TV 18.